Major League Journeyman, Dax McCarty, Alan Gordon, Dan Gargan, all in attendance. We took a little bit of hiatus to allow Gordo to turn into part man, part robot. Uh, <laughs> not, not the addition that you would think. Gordo coming in hot with a new hip. With the recipient of a brand new plastic <laughs> hip. Usually <laughs> reserved for 72-year-old women, Alan Gordon <laughs> makes the jump early on in his lifetime. Gordo, how are we feeling? How are we doing? I've always been a trendsetter, dude. You know, so <laughs> I just want to be the first one of my draft class to get a new hip. And look, All right. You yeah, are. I, I, feel, I feel great, man. I, I really do. I feel great. I feel like... Did you just pop a painkiller before this pot or what? Yeah, what are we what are we on right now? You, you ever you ever heard heard of a Pez dispenser? <laughs> just put those put those oxys right in there, pal. Just, uh, I, we've heard of it. I don't think some of our younger listeners know what you're talking about, but essentially it's just a uh daddy's just getting what he wants on call, huh? Oh yeah. I mean I I get I went through those pain pills in record time. Another another <laughs> record I hold. <laughs> Uh, you actually uh, might be leading the league still a as an ex player in surgeries performed. <laughs> Alan that, Gordon. That, that, that was surgeries cool. performed with least amount of games played. With least, <laughs> with least wear and tear on his actual body. <laughs> uh, what are you doing? Gordo, you're you're back in your office, so you're already working again? Where are you at? What are you doing? Dude, they, they, these hips, if you want to get if you want to get serious, these hips are like you know, it is, it is the surgery of all surgeries out there right now. I mean, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive. I mean, they got you up walking out of the, out of the hospital. Um, you know, I feel, I feel good. The first few days were kind of brutal. I just showed you guys off air, you know, how <laughs> beat up my, how beat up my hip was, but, um, yeah. I'm feeling, I'm feeling, shouldn't decent. have to see that. I'm, I'm moving better right now. One week post op than I was in my final year playing with, <laughs> <laughs> are you are you on a walker yeah oh yeah dude i i did i did the whole tennis balls and everything <laughs> i'm like this thing is so legit i'm so proud of it man i'm like you know those when you go to the grocery store and you get to ride around in those little you're those on little a motorized car yeah. are you on a scooter posted it on my social guys we guys saw it caught up Dude, I went. I went for a little joyride. It was great. It was just me, and I went down. Do you have a cane? Do you gotta like? I, I, you gotta I, I, like get the stuff off the top shelf on with the cane. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna move to a cane next week. Um, I'm gonna. I'm gonna start looking for a little pimp cane. If anybody has a good site, <laughs> a nice little Mac Daddy cane, you know, send it my way. Oh my! God. Are you going bamboo or like the ones that you could pull out and they turn into a sword? Where yes. are we going? And they're, they've all been discussed. <laughs> all they're options all, are on the table. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I need a sword in Centennial, Colorado. Um, <laughs> there hasn't been a crime here since, you know, 62. <laughs> I, think, I think we'll be just good. I did, however, two days post-op. Two days post-op, I was out on the coaching, on the field, on the sideline, coaching my daughter to another victory so add that to the to trophy case we got we're going for our fifth straight supporter shield so you know you, you just can't can't take a day off we're we're counting saturday wins into the trophy case collection oh it's it's on our way to a trophy case but if i wasn't <laughs> gonna be there we could have lost that game it was a decent side yeah wow i tell you well, you wait you may you may not have you may not have good hips but you're still sharp as a tack upstairs huh no, tactical what? genius that's what they say but you can't teach that you no, can't you teach can't. that some people I'm see the game some right. people don't gordo and you got it man i've been saying that forever you got it <laughs> what so i'm assuming and maybe this is a wrong assumption but sitting around on the couch a fair amount maybe you're watching a little bit more soccer did you catch the uh open cup final last night i did I did. Um, I caught the second half. I was coaching, coaching my son, rushed home, was disappointed not to see Messi out there, you know, um, and Jordi Alba. I, I'll tell you what, man, it, it's, it's incredible. That, that team is just not the same without, without those two, even with Sergio and Sergio is not the same without those two. You know, he doesn't have Messi to pass the ball to. 
you know, and it's just shocker. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, it's a, it's a crazy look and it just, you know, it just speaks, you know, to, it's almost, to it's almost like if you take the greatest player of all time out of a team, they're probably not going to look as good. It, it's Wild. almost like that. It, it's crazy. That's, that's the hard hitting analysis you get with the journeyman. I yeah. gotta say. I can, okay, Dan, we can we can end the pod right now. Done. That's it. We've got it. If you take Leo <laughs> off the field, you're screwed. Almost, almost. It's always groundbreaking here. From, well, from you know, but I'll, I'll tell you what I took away from that. That what did game. you take away from it? Yeah, my boy Benny Olson, dude. I love this guy so much, dude. I I, I just I rate him as a human being so highly. Um, you know, I've never been in a locker room with him, with him coaching. I know he's a really intelligent guy. He's sharp. Um, he's a player's coach. He's always been just one of my faves. Um, and I was, I was really stoked for him, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it's just such a weird fit him with Houston because Houston, Houston's got always historically has got a bunch of South Americans, right. And they're all speaking Spanish and you, you really, you know, you want to look down that we're used to looking down that, that sideline and seeing like Pareja or, you know, one of, one of those coaches that, that has more of a, a commonality with those players, but Ben, the, but they seem to be buying in, man. And they got some good, they got a good squad. Um, you know, they got a couple, well, who's that Honduran with the, with the, uh, the Afro. He, he's, he's Pan, beast. Panamanian. <coughs> Panamanian. 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 Yeah. He is a beast. Yeah. He's a baller dude. And so, you know, watching them, I was more focused on them, dude. And I was happy. I was rooting for them. I wanted them to win. And then to see, um, you know, Beth or Ben celebrate the way he did after it just, mm -hmm. just, it just shows you like it really mattered to him, man. Like mm -hmm. we, we talk about, you know, I've, I've gone on, on record here and said that the U S open, you know, doesn't matter as much as it should, but it certainly mattered to him, you know, and, and looking at the way that he celebrated. So, you know, hats off to Benny, man. He's, uh, you know, like I said, he's one of my faves. That almost felt like cathartic for Ben. If you see like some of the celebration videos and some of the mm -hmm. pictures, and I'll take it a step further than Gordo. If you think about Ben Olsen and his days with DC United as a player, just almost unparalleled success, right? With MLS Cups and best 11s and all-stars. And like, I think perennially, one of the most underrated players in the league when he was playing, but also like a well-respected guy who was just a winner through and through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Take that and compare it to his coaching career with DC, where he was thrown into the job. I was there for his first full season when he traded for me and we had a couple young guys and I was oh, only with right. him for six. I was only, I was only with him for five or six months. What year was that, Dax? Was that 13 or 14? That was 2011. 2011, okay. And, and you could tell right away that that Ben was a little bit in over his head and and he really didn't know what he was about as a coach and he's admitted this a, a bunch of times that he was just thrown to the wolves and he just had to figure it out and the yeah. entire time his entire time at DC United he always had to pick up the pieces and put a, pu pu a puzzle together when they were trying to get a training facility when they were trying to get a stadium and they had no money and they never spent any money on players and he mm -hmm. was always signing American veteran guys that he could trust and that he knew would take them to the playoffs. And it was inconsistent. And there was really not, for me, it didn't feel like there was ever a lot of joy coming out of DC United during those years that Ben was there. And let's say he was there for eight, nine, 10 years. You never felt there was any joy. And the one trophy they won was the US Open Cup. Mm -hmm. And yes, did they celebrate it? Sure, of course they did. They beat a great Real Salt Lake team in Salt Lake. But do you know what? I feel like Ben couldn't actually really enjoy it because they were in the midst of the worst season that any team has ever had in MLS history. Yeah. So to me, this season in general, not just them winning the Open Cup in Houston, but this season in general feels like such a cathartic moment for Ben where he's just released all kinds of bad memories and bad demons and and I'm 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 certain he would admit that like his time at DC was great but if you look at how just these 8 or 9 months have gone for Ben and Houston I just really don't think they could have gone any better when they have already won a trophy an important trophy in the Open Cup they're playing great in the league they're in a great position to not just make the playoffs but host playoff games and yeah and 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 it, it feels to me like like Ben is is really a lot more secure in who he is as a coach. And he even said it. I saw a great quote 
um, from Ben after the game, talking about Houston and talking in general just about their players. And he said, you know what? My job is really just to give these guys a platform to succeed. And once they are in that platform, I let them have freedom because I'm not going to be able to coach a guy like Karaskia or Hector Herrera or Bossy. I'm not going to be able to tell them what to do in certain attacking situation. I'm going to let them play off instinct. I'm going to let them play with Mm -hmm. each other because these guys actually like and enjoy playing with each other and figuring it out on the fly. And Mm -hmm. even Hector Herrera said something similar. They don't really have a style of play. They're just freestyling, and it's working. And Ben, like you said, Gordo, he's one of your favorite guys because he's such a great person. He's such a great human being, and he can relate. And to your point earlier, Gordo, their last two coaches, I think, were Wilmer Cabrera and Paulo Nagamura, guys who can relate to speaking Spanish, having a a heavy Hispanic, Central South American influence in the locker room. Guess what? I don't know how much Spanish Ben knows, but he can relate to those guys, no problem, Mm -hmm. right? He grew up with El Diablo playing with Echeverry and Jaime Moreno. Like, he can relate to these guys, no problem, just like any great coach should be able to do. But the first half, Gordo, that you missed, Houston pissed all over Inner Miami and played them off the park and Mm -hmm. it should have been 4-0 and so for me yes i mean we've we talked about miami a million times on this pod for me the main thing is about houston and how great they played and how how happy i am for ben who's such a great guy and a great person and how houston looks like a real threat uh for many years to come and one more thing let's not forget to give credit to pat onstad who has put together a roster i i couldn't name half their team if you if, if they were in a starting 11 and I didn't know any of these guys, where they're from, where they played prior, and what Ben has them doing. It shows you that that's great scouting, that's great roster salary cap work, and Ben putting it all together, culminating in a in a trophy that was well deserved. So I'm really happy for them, and it was it was well deserved for Houston. Coming coming full circle on that, it, I think that when I think about Ben being hired there and what you just mentioned in terms of Pat Onstad, Pat also made a course correction, which I think is is pretty impressive in hiring Paulo Nagamura. And as soon as he recognized that this wasn't the right fit or wasn't going to work, went out and got Ben Olsen. And getting Ben Olsen now, now thinking about it, because that was not necessarily a heralded signing. So I don't think that the media or really anybody um, in a lot of ways were like, okay, Ben is this... Yep perfect piece for Houston, but now you can look at it and the Houston dynamo, I think a lot's been made after now that they've won this championship and, and playing the football that they are playing, which is pretty impressive. Um, what are they? They're two points out, two points out of second place. Um, right in fourth, I think with Seattle and LAFC who LAFC looks like they are on a slow skid down. Um, but now you think about the profile that Ben Olsen is like, he's a grinder and he's uh, a player's coach and he takes things personally. And the, I think the, the decade that he spent in DC was, was one that probably positioned him really well to take on a project that is almost a reclamation project for the Houston Dynamo, gathering back respect and earning eyeballs and earning appreciation from the league because everybody kind of stopped giving the Dynamo that appreciation that they had built up when Onstad was a player, you know, when, when they had those guys and those teams that were pretty impressive. Now you have Ben Olsen coming in. So I wanted to, to ask you guys, because this is the direction that, you know, we kind of talked about heading in is Benny's reputation. Has it been unfair to him as a coach because of the situation that he was in, in DC and the way that he's been portrayed or was portrayed going into Houston? Like, are, are we talking about a coach that has, has that sauce and has that seasoning to really kind of be successful moving forward? What, what are, what are your thoughts there? Is, is there an unfair perception around Ben as a coach because of what he endured in DC? I mean, I think you have to take it what it is, you know, and I think they would, I think he would agree with this. Um, Yes, yes and no. I mean, I think, you know, the position he was put in, you know, only, only because he was so well respected at DC, would he be given uh, the the wheel, you know, to, to take on a a team with, with such great history. It's not like he was taking over an expansion team. He was taking over DC United had, um, who, at the, uh, who at that time was probably the most decorated 
uh, team in the league. They were, you know, but so, so, so yes, he had to learn in, in under the public eye, right? He he wasn't going to, he wasn't going to be polished. You know, Dak Dak touched on it. He was in the locker room with Ben. Can you imagine? Uh, I mean, can you imagine how hard it would be to go from being a player and the next day, essentially, you are in front of the locker room and they are looking at you to 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 for what to do, you know, tactically, structurally, um, you know, which, which direction are we moving in? Not, not only that, who am I playing? Who am I not playing? How mm-hmm. am I going to separate, um, my, my teammates and my, my friends now that I was just sitting next to in a locker room to now having to separate that because I can't do both. Yeah. You know, there has to be some sort of separation when you become the gaffer and then, because you got to make tough decisions, and sometimes those are guys that you really like, and you have to make tough calls. So, so for him to, I, I don't know if it was unfair, because he got that opportunity, and everybody has to have an opportunity. But, but yes, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't going, it, it didn't go, it didn't go totally smooth because he had to learn. Um, but I think that Ben is such an intelligent guy that over the past, how long is he? you know, not had a job three, four years, something like that. Right. Yeah. About, um, about three years. You know, I, I guarantee you because, you know, all three of us know Ben, this guy was, he wasn't just sitting around sulking, right. He was, no, he, he was, was around painting. He was doing, yeah, he, was work. Painting. <laughs> he was getting, he was getting <laughs> introspective, right. He was getting painting, some in- painting naked. <laughs> <laughs> and spraying, but, you know, he, he was, he was, he was trying to, he was probably reflecting a lot on his time and then he was removed. And sometimes, you know, when you're in it, you can't really separate yourself and then, and then learn from it. So he probably took that time and, and grew a lot. And there, there's, there's other, uh, you know, there's other examples of this. Pablo Mascheroni did the same exact thing mm-hmm. in Colorado. Okay? Yeah. And now, and now he's, having, he's having a ton of success in Salt Lake. Yeah. But I, I spent a lot of time with Pablo, not a lot of time, but I spent some time with Pablo golfing and talking about his time. I'm, I'm uh, genuinely curious of these guys and, and their stories. And both I've talked to Ben about his too. And, and I've listened to them talk about those experiences of standing in front of, of a locker room, you know, directly after being a player. It's not easy. And, and Pablo had to do the same exact thing. Right. And then Jason Christ did that. There's, there's different examples, right? But those, those early years are always going to be learning. So I don't think it's un, unfair, but I think that now is his time in this stint and he's already doing it. He's won a, he's won a trophy. Uh, but now is his time to really, you know, show the league and show the, the, the fans that he is not a new coach anymore. He's an experienced coach. Yeah. And he's learned from his from his experiences. So, Max, do you think we ever see that in Major League Soccer ever again? The the profile of a Pablo Mastroeni or a, or a Ben Olsen or um, a Jason Christ stepping in off of the field straight into a first team coaching staff into the head <laughs> seat. I w- I was about to say no. I don't think we're ever going to see that ever again. But I've changed my mind a little bit thinking about one player in particular who I think will do something similar and probably will be given the reins if it doesn't go well up north in the next year or two. Are you we talking, thinking of? Uh, Michael Bradley? Bingo! Hey. <laughs> I mean, look, that's the only guy who really comes to mind that I think would not just want to do something like that, but have the mental wherewithal to be able to step in and, and do something like that. Um but to answer your who, question, as an who overall, who else is plot, out there? Though? Who else is out there? I mean, because you know, for me, like Dex, you're you're in that conversation of guys that have sure. been around long enough that may have enough credibility to walk straight into a first team coaching staff because of the length of tenure and also what you've yeah, been able. To I appreciate that, and I think that's a fair shout as well. I don't think we're ever going to see it because there's too many eyeballs on MLS now for you to just hand the rein, and there's too much accountability now for you to just hand the reins over to a guy who's just stepping off the field. You mm-hmm. know, I think that the, there is a, a process and steps involved now in becoming a great coach. And I look at what Pat Noonan did, right? I almost like Jimmy Curtin. I look what he did st- starting in the Academy, 
right? Noonan starting Noonan as an, is also another one who's like he kind of he kind of was thrown into his it. His leash, right? His leash of learning how to be a head right. coach was pretty short. Yeah. It was, but he had, but he was in the academy. I, I don't know for how long, but he was in the academy in Philly for right. A year he t- or he two took steps. Before. Not saying he, he took didn't the take steps. steps. I just think now but it was quick. It was right. quick that he ascended into the spot. I, that yeah, he's in. I agree, and I think that if there is. A, a sporting director out there who has a great relationship with an older guy in the league right now that's, you know, wanting to go into coaching. And he says, you know, I see you being a head coach one day. And if that sporting director is lucky enough to have a job for as long as it takes for that player retiring to go and get some experience for a year or two, and mm-hmm. if it doesn't go well at that club and he says, you're my guy, maybe that could happen. Will a guy do what, you know, Benny did and Pablo and Jason Christ did step right off the playing field into a coaching job? I don't think we ever see that ever again. Yeah. And I think it's I think it's negligent and I think it's a little bit especially now where we are in MLS's progress of a league who people want to look at and in the amount of eyeballs on this league that's taken a lot more seriously than it was back in those days I just don't think you can put a a, a person in that situation you what know what I mean this, Dax? Yeah, yeah. well here's here I'll push back just a touch and then I, I want to hear your perspective Gordo because these guys that we mentioned um your name included, Michael Bradley, Jim Curtin, Ben Olson, Pablo Mastroeni, they all have incredible, intangible leadership profiles that you you really can't replicate in a lot of situations. It takes years and years and years of leading men in a locker room, which is why I think they are so attractive as candidates to be to be your head coach. I'm interested to see. I think that we will. I think that there yeah. will be there will be another player that comes through this league that ultimately ascends into that space. Um, because here's of the difference, that, because Dan. of that in particular, because of and that's that. fine. And I agree with that, but here's the difference. The difference is leading a locker room of men while you are going to in the trenches with them every day on the field is much mm-hmm. different than being the guy sending them out onto the field and saying, this is completely. where you have to do. So, I agree. So, that's, I agree with that so, so, so that, that change from a player in a locker room, who's a great leader to now a coach who has a different relationship with every single one of those players, that's mm-hmm. totally different. And th- that's why I think what Gordo was talking about with Ben, I think Ben found it hard, right? Because Ben, I think as a coach, when you go right. and try to lead Still players who are around your age, kids. you can't really be that friendly with them. And mm-hmm. when you're friends with them, and like Ben was bringing in guys after he was two, three years as a coach, I mean, he was bringing in Davey Arnault, to help him try to right the ship with with DC and Davies, like I don't know, maybe his age or a year or two younger than him, you know. Yeah. And that dichotomy, it's just there's always going to be a little bit of push pull there. With hey, you're not in the team this week. Hey, uh, you know, I, you're not even in the 18. Whatever it may be, it's just different. And so, mm-hmm. look, I don't disagree that there will be anomalies and outliers of maybe something crazy happens and a coach gets fired and they're like, hey, like this player who just retired, we need you to step up and be the interim for a little while. And maybe you do great and we're going to give you the full-time job, but I don't think there's ever going to be a situation where Jason Christ retired and then like a month later, boom, you're the head coach of Real. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't think we see that unless it's, honestly, I could see it happening with Michael um, because I, I I do think he wants to be a coach. Um, I think that's the main thing, right? And for me, I'm still up in the air of like, I do love that side of the game, but it's like, do I want to be a coach? I don't know. You know, those are hard conversations to have with myself, with my family. Like you guys probably went through it. Um, I'd be curious to hear, you know, even you, Dan, like mm-hmm. I'd be curious to hear if you went through that, that kind of idea of wanting to coach, wanting to put yourself in a position to lead players, but also putting yourself in a vulnerable position to where, hey, if I go down this path, I don't have much security. I don't have much stability in my life. That's, I mean, that's a big question for guys that are co- that are coming out of retirement, asking their families to move with them every couple of years. I mean, that's tough, man. It is tough. Um, and I, I mean, I, I did go through that. I, Gordo, Gordo made, I think, um, a different decision to get out of the sport altogether in terms of, you know, switching a career. Um, so Gordo, what, what are your thoughts on that in terms of, do you think we'll see this again? Yeah, I think, I think it could happen. I, I agree with what Dax was saying. I think it, it could be, it, it, j- it has to be the right situation. I mean, Dax, how long did it take Thierry to get a head coaching job? He coached pretty fast, right? Um, I think it took him a couple years. He retired in 2014. And then I think he maybe was like, he was like the assistant coach of Belgium for a couple of seasons. 
right? That's right. Then, was it even a couple? I felt, I felt like we saw him, and all of a sudden he was at a World Cup as an assistant. I agree. Right. Well, but well, that's but that's as an assistant. Was, I think it's different when you go straight into totally, being an assistant yeah. for a big so, team. You know, so my my take on it, I agree with everything Dak said. I think it, it would take somebody really, really special. I think Michael could be one of those guys, I, but I, I I really do because um, if you've been in the locker room with Michael, I was on you know national team with him ten years ago when he was like. 24 and he was like the 40 year old in the room he was yeah he's he, just he, got the itch yeah he's got the itch he wants to be a coach so i i, I think it's okay to do it's got to be the right person and whoever makes that decision whoever whatever sporting director makes that decision what i would do is you know you got to put some if, if that's going to be your coach you got to put some real experience on on his staff on his staff mm-hmm. on his staff and you got to almost have guys that could be your head coach, but you're going to have a conversation with them and be like, listen, you're going to groom Michael. Okay. He's going to be the face and he's going to be the coach. Okay. But you're going to be his counsel. You're going to be his yeah. lead. counsel, Okay. And you're going to work with him through this. So I think it, it could happen. I don't think it should happen. I think that everybody should spend some time on a staff as an assistant to, to mature and develop and see what that side looks like. Because we've all that we've all had tons of conversations with guys that have made our way over. I spent a ton of time with Connor Casey, who you you're good friends with Gargs and mm-hmm. and just talking through the the different emotions, man. It's it's a real, real weird jump for guys to go from one side of the locker to the other side of the locker. Really. Yep. And that's why I think it takes time, right? Because it of does. that dichotomy. You, you just, you, it's, it's, you can't put a price on that experience of like putting cones down, right? Drawing up training exercises yeah. and figuring <clears throat> out how you're going to get the best out of your players. I mean, I just think that takes time, right? Yeah. So, I, yes, I think there will be outliers and there will be moments in, in MLS's history where a guy's going to step off the field and maybe get thrust right into a head coaching role, but I really don't think it's going to happen very often. Yeah. 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 I think, and granted, I, I haven't coached, but I, I would have to think that the toughest part um, for the transition is having to say no or having to reprimand without mm. being able to do it yourself. So right. walking out and showing this is how it's done. And I need for you to do this because yeah. as a coach, mm. you're just telling and you're asking, saying, I want you to do this, not let me show you how it's done and come with me, do it together. I think the, I think the best coaches have great people around them who don't just like placate them, but they disagree with them and they say, Hey, uh, I don't agree with you in this scenario. You need that healthy tension in a coaching staff, just like you need a healthy tension on the field between players, right? You kind of need that, you know? And then I think you also need like kind of what Gordo was talking about. You need a, an experienced staff, who's going to be able to problem solve together. And if you have that, you are going to be in a very good place. We also, this week, saw three uh, contract extensions, three totally different players that got extended in Justin Glad for Real Salt Lake, Lucho Acosta for FC Cincinnati, and Leo Campana um, at Inter Miami. Three completely different player profiles, three different positions, three just... All, all different um, looks for these guys and these extensions for these clubs. In one, who was the most valuable extension for these clubs to lock up? Go ahead, Gordo. Gordo. I don't Gordo. Wanna, I you, want you, you to go first. first. You're, you're the baby when you don't go first. You get first, Gordo. First crack at it. It's it's how it's hard not to uh, to pick the the leading MVP candidate in a cost mm-hmm. it's really hard. It, is, it is hard not to pick that okay but- do it and i'll just dominate you go ahead you want to dominate me you want to- <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> i'm i'm not i'm yeah i'm, I'm picking a cost dude uh you know he's he's he, hey did you guys see his last goal i want to talk yeah. about this really quick ridiculous Ridiculous or ridiculously selfish because he wants the MVP or both. <laughs> or both. Which which MVP, to be fair, is not ridiculously selfish at times on the field. All right. So I mean that one that one is like I think that that one could have won him the MVP award, the Landon Donovan. Mm-hmm. I think that goal won him and sealed him the the uh, 
the award. I really do. But okay. he should have passed the freaking ball and won the game. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he the ball. Did you see Baji? Baji didn't even celebrate with him. He's like, come on, man. Yeah. He's like, I got a bonus, dude. I need yeah. one. <laughs> I need this bonus. Oh, yeah, yeah, but except for Acosta just got the biggest bonus. Listen, on the you guys know how Andres. it is. If <laughs> if he goes and scores the goal, you can't say anything. If he misses, anything, then right. you can F him off all you want. No, no, right. no. Okay, I'm taking him. I don't want to take too much time on this. I want to, I want to hear what I think. I think all of them except for one. And I don't want to kill this guy on air. I really don't. I think he's he's done a good job. And I know you're going to defend redheads on this on this <laughs> podcast. Guys. So I'll let you go. Um, but Capana has been awesome. You know, Capana. You know, I'm not sure. I wasn't. Capana's watching- got the smallest sample size out of all three. But your guy Acosta to help you with your argument. Since he came back from Atlas in 2021, they signed him as a DP. His on uh, in regular season goal and assist contribution, second in the league overall, and he's 29. So a 29 year old Argentine flipped. No, it's a good resigning. It's flipped a good FC Cincinnati. You extend him for I think four years, maybe through 2027. That's a long. That's a long contract. No, it's good. He should be. He should be the face of the franchise after this MVP run, whether he wins it or not. Um, you know, this new franchise in Cincinnati. He's going to be the face of the franchise for the next four years, right? He's a, he's a quality player. He's somebody that you need to lock up. They did a good job in doing that. Yeah. And so obviously Noonan's getting the best out of him. And, um, you know, that's all I got to say about it. I mean, the, I don't the know what is, I don't know what his deal looks like, but I would have to think that as soon as a ton of this money gets pumped into the league in this off season, his deal is going to look cheap, whatever it is, whatever the number is, by the time he's done, assuming that he continues to contribute, which I don't know why he wouldn't, He's, it's going to be a great signing to get it yeah. before, before the cap opens up. Dax, who you take? Um, I mean, obviously, <clears throat> it's hard to argue with Gordo's logic. Acosta is one of the best players in the league, and I think he is probably at this point the front runner for the MVP. But the answer to this question specifically is Campana. And mm-hmm. the reason why it is Campana is uh, there's a couple things here. And I'll go into the, the first one being. Campana's sample size is a little bit smaller than the other guys. Sure. A lot smaller. But, but you guys know as well as I do, the most important thing and the most important aspect that MLS GMs are looking for when they're building a team is someone that is going to score goals. No, it's okay? not. It's attacking defensive minded right backs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dan, but, like, but it's, poor, it's, it's, it's poor man Danny Carvajal's. Okay. <laughs> Hey, how many how many goals does Campana have in how many games, dude? Does anybody know Statman Jack? Uh, Statman anybody? Jack can pull that up. But here's here here's here's the reason why it's Campana. You have Messi, you have Busquets, you have Jordi Alba. We know Messi and Busquets are DPS for the life of their contracts. That's fine. Mm-hmm. Jordi Alba somehow is a TAM player. I would I would assume. You have all these pieces, and you're putting all these pieces around Leo Messi and Sergio Busquets. And the one thing that these guys need more than anything else in the world, other than a a, a decent stable of runners around them, is a goal scorer. Because Messi, for as great as he is, this is not what his main role and task is anymore in his career, in my opinion. He's going Mm -hmm. to score his goals. He's going to he's going to create chances. He's going to score goals. But for me, he's more of a facilitator at this point in his career. And even in MLS, where when he gets around the goal, he can finish in any way he wants, he still naturally will drop deeper into midfield and try to create chances. So if you can have a player that is young, I don't know how old Campana is. I think he's 23 or 24. And is he that young? He's 22. He's, he's 22 years old. Mm-hmm. He looks like it, he's 40. Dude, he's a he is a beast. He's, he's 20. Okay. Stat man, Jack. Thank you. He's 23 years old. He's, Holy he's rough. physically exactly the profile that most MLS teams are looking for in a guy up top. He's, he's, good, he's, he's bigger than you and younger and stronger. I didn't know he was and that better looking he and better like looking. looking, much better looking. Anyways, like I thought he was an older. Sign. The, the, the point is if you can find a consistent goal scorer on a relatively good number, that is worth its weight in gold. And so Acosta is fantastic, and he's one of the best players in the league. But he's only as great as he is, and his numbers are only as big as they are because they have lots of dangerous attacking options around him. Brandon Vasquez, uh, 
Bupenza, uh, what's his name? Um, I, don't they know just sold. I, would, I don't know if I would Brenner. agree with that, Dax. Lucho <laughs> can carry a game on he his can, own. He can, but you're off. not. He can, but but goal scoring is not his main attribute. You know okay, that. Okay, well, dude, he's, he's creative. Got, I, he's got nine goals this season. Acosta's yes. got. Acosta yeah, has, I know, I know. Campana's been injured. Campana's been injured. Yeah, I don't think he's, he's played as many minutes. Games 21 played. games. Nine goals in 21 games. Three games played, nine okay, goals. Okay, look at the minutes. He's been splitting time with Joseph Martinez. We, he has we been doing that. This. Right, so is, okay. I'm My assuming... Point, this is, and also, I mean, Acosta has what, seven, six, seven PKs? It, it doesn't matter. The point is this. You're, you, you build a team with these great designated players. You have to have a goal score. Now, sure. you that. can go and spend... $15 million to, to sign a proven goal scorer and pay them a uh, DP money. I don't, I, I'm assuming Campana's new deal will make him a DP, but it's at surely a really manageable number and he's young. He has resale value and he already has rapport with Messi. That's the most important thing. It's of course going to be this guy 23 years old. Crazy. But my point is this, his with two his, hips, Gordo. he's got two hips also. His, <laughs> his hips. <laughs> I think Inter Miami's ability to know that they have Campana under contract already, I think makes their transfer window coming up in the winter way easier. If they if something becomes available to them, let's say a Luis Suarez, they can say, "Hey, listen, we would love for you to come here, but we we can't pay you DP money. We can give you Tam, sure. Can you like Campana just gives them so much flexibility and so many different options that I think this was, and I think he was only on loan, right?" I'm pretty sure he was on loan, so I'm not really sure like what a permanent transfer looks like and how much his transfer <clears> fee was. But for me, he is a relatively cheap option and a proven goal scorer to put with Messi. And for me, that's the main thing that Inter Miami needed. And I think Campan is young enough to where he's only going to improve and get better. I, he, and he will improve. And I and I appreciate your efforts on this. It was tough to go against Acosta, but I mean. Well, you, I won. So just didn't do it the just answer to this now. question is obvious. No, I mean Acosta is going to be better, but it, it was a it was a landslide. It wasn't even a fair fight. And this I year, it. this this year, this year, I agree. Upside potential for the next couple of seasons and roster flexibility. I think Campana is the better deal. I like. Wait, so hold on, and you guys, you guys Never. aren't even gonna you aren't you aren't even gonna touch. Justin Glad, who's been with I want you to touch him. for 10 I years. He's been with there for, for 10 one. years, 10 years, and he's 26 years old. You just locked up a 26 year old center back with fringe, fringe U.S. national team, right? Fringe. Fringe. No. Fringe. no. Never? Fringe. No, dude. No. The, I, I would say a couple camps, maybe, but. He's not a fringe national he's team. He's not a fringe national team guy. You don't think you could call, you can't, you can't call him a fringe national team player. No, I, I don't think so. All right. I disagree. I think potential wise fringe national team player, maybe with potential upside, he's got what? 200, maybe 250 games in the league. I think it's, I think it's a great signing for salt Lake, but it doesn't compare to the two that you've mentioned with him. Also, he's, also he's, came through their Academy homegrown signing. will stay with the club for the rest of his career, right? Seemingly the rest of his sure. career, other four or five years. And you're locking up, a piece of your spine that you could, that could easily take off in the middle Correct. of a transfer. Four I think nine. it's, I, I think it's a good signing. I don't think there's anything wrong with locking a guy like that up. I don't think it compares to the other guys that you mentioned. They're all good signings. And it's this, this argument is stupid without knowing the numbers and the details of each contract, because I agree if, if Campana, if they got a good deal for him, then he's, he's the number one. He's, he wins. Right. If they, if they overpaid for Acosta, then it's not as good of a deal and a, and a signing as, you know, and, and the same for Glad. It depends on what the terms are. Okay? Yeah, okay, that's fair. Guy, I think in the short term, Acosta is probably going to be one of the most expensive players in the league. So, right, is, so in the short so term, is he, worth, is he worth being the most expensive player in the league? Maybe not. So Campana at that point, we need to know the details. He would be a better re-signing at that point. And I need to know what Glad is what his numbers are because if they're going to pay him, you know, over a million dollars, if he's going to be a DP, do you think of he's going to start paying him over a million dollars? He's going to be a DP. He's going to be one of your DPs. No, I don't think he'll be. A no, DP. he'll be a TAM what, player. What's the, what's the cap for a DP now? It's over 1.6 or seven, something like that. Oh, 
Things have changed, huh, guards? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a. Hey, it's not six hundred k anymore. Gordon. I remember Bruce. Yeah, I remember Bruce saying to me, "You know, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you one seventy five because I don't want to make you a DP." <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but it, it really does. At that point, dude, I I I respect Glad, dude, but I don't I don't think that he's a top defender. I never have, and he makes too many mistakes. I've seen some highlights this year where he's given away soft goals, he gets exposed. And I don't think that he is a, I don't think that he's a top 20. Top center back in the league. Top center back in the league. I don't. Um, but if they resigned him at a decent number, okay, and decent these days, if they resigned him at 750, I'd be like, you know what? It's a good resigning for everything that you said. But if it's, if it's above a million, I, I don't think that he's worth that. I say I, think it's, I, I, I don't agree. I don't agree with Gordo on that. I think it's a great resigning, regardless of the number. Even if he's a town, if he's under, if he's under the DP threshold, I don't care how much he's making. If he's making one point five million, I still think it's a great signing. Because in my opinion, other than other than goal scorers, the spine of your team, I agree, Gordo. It has to be the I, strongest part of your team. So you you lock up a guy who's still in. Maybe you haven't even seen the best of him yet. He's entering his prime. You know that like. I'm not giving you fringe national team, but you know that he's not going to be called up and miss big chunks of time. Durable. Right? You, I'll give you that much. He's durable. He's going to be on the field for you. And he's got a big connection to the community. I think it's a great re-signing. But mm -hmm. when you talk about an MVP candidate in Acosta, and when you talk about potentially a golden, a perennial golden boot contender for the next couple of years in Campana, I just he doesn't compare to those other two signings. But I think it's a great signing. I think Salt Lake, it's, it's a no-brainer for them to lock up a guy who's going to be a part of your spine for years to come. So you just, you know, sorry, sorry, Gargs. You're, you're oh, out on oh, this one. Listen, we're bet, we're bet, you're betting, and if I'm taking Glad, which I don't know if I am, just throwing that out there. <laughs> well, uh, you are. You are. Hey, you're news flash, you, you got Glad. Sorry, right. bro. You're betting on potential, uh, which I think a defender entering – the prime of his career at 26 years old for a club that he feels really comfortable with is significantly valuable for that club. Why, why are we calling a, tw a guy that's been in the league 10 years and he's 26 heading into the prime? It's, it's not, it's not. For, for a defender, us, I think it is. For me and you guards, I didn't hit my prime till I was 28 to 30 because I spent, we went to college and right. we were, and we, it was different then. But in Europe, if you're you think 26, the wear and tear makes a big, big difference. What you think the wear and tear that he's had for playing oh. ten years makes a big well, difference? Well, I mean, look at Europe and look at why did you get cut from from the Red Bulls? Because in Europe, you're well, what's what's their thresholds? Twenty six. Was it twenty five? We're not. Red Bulls. Red Bulls a little different. Red Bulls a little different. In, and I didn't get cut. I got Europe. traded. This is this is this is new age, Dan. We're catching up with Europe with guys okay. that have been playing at a high level since they were in their teenage years. Okay. okay. And so it's different. the The trajectory is different for them. They peak earlier because they're young. And yes, because their brain and their experience and their bodies all meet up a little bit younger. I got to say, I, I'm totally out on Gordo with this. Totally out. I, I completely disagree with you. Agree. I, like I agree. 100 percent. Like totally, unequivocally disagree. And you're saying we haven't seen the best of him. Like when? I, dude? Yes, I am. Uh, absolutely. I still think I still think at 26, you can get better. And it's not like you're not jumping leaps and bounds, but you can you get can incrementally get better because you get better up here. You're, as he's a not center back, he's not changing back, any physically. One thousand percent, one thousand percent. We will see I'm, I'm the best saying. version of Justin Glad over the next four years. I I couldn't disagree more. If you're talking about maybe I'm, I'm saying, like, we're signing, excitement we're of a winger know, and in uh -huh. that, in that vein, then maybe yes, the youth, the the free you know free wheeling, confidence, 22, 23, 24, maybe. But even then, like. You're still betting on a different thing. You're you're betting on the projection of a player that doesn't really understand the game and its complexities yet. So in in that position, two hundred fifty matches. Two hundred fifty matches is two hundred fifty matches. Yeah, you you know you sh you should know what's going on out Gordo, in the field. You you'd be you you'd be right. You'd be right. I think physically, probably like 30, 40 years ago. These days, dude, there are so many different 
recovery modalities, strength programs. Like players in general aren't going to, dude, Messi, Ronaldo, these guys, the top players in Europe play eight, 900 games in their career, right? So <laughs> Justin Glad playing for 10 years that. and having 250, 300 games under his belt right now, he's not falling off a cliff at 28. I'm not, I'm not saying that. That's what that. you said. What? No, I didn't. I said that the other way. I wasn't. I, I was saying that he has enough under his belt to be in his prime right now. Not, hey, he's heading into his prime. Like his prime is not coming. He should be solidly the best version of himself. Yes, as you get older, the brain starts working. Things slow down a little bit, of course. But that typically comes with games. Guys, games. He's got mm-hmm. 250 games. Mm-hmm. He should be his prime. You think you th- th- here's what you're saying. You think he's the best version of himself right now. Me and Dan think he still can get better. I think anybody can get better, but I think he should be in his prime. Okay? He should be in his prime. We shouldn't be signing him. We shouldn't be signing Glad or RSL should be signing Glad to be like, you know what? I think this guy's gonna get better. Let's lock him up the next four years. Dude, he's and that's why you're not a GM. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, what are you doing? What 250 are we doing? games is a lot of games, but he's got another 250 in front of him easily. And front end, front end of his prime. He is entering, maybe he is entering his prime, heading Next. into the top of he's his He's going to be, he's, he's definitely going to be an, another Real Salt Lake guy to beat Beckerman's record, appearance record for sure. Him yeah, and Fagundes. For sure. For sure. Yeah. All right. So last question for you. The Seattle Sounders just rebranded. One thumb up, two thumbs up, one thumb down, two thumbs down. What do we got for the rebrand? Dax, how you feeling? Two thumbs up. I like it a lot. Me and Gordo both did at the same time. Wow. I like it a lot, man. I'm I, I like the simplicity of it. I like the fact that they incorporated their history and their roots. And yeah, man, I got something for for orcas, dude. That's a cool. That's a that that's a cool logo, man. I just like it. <laughs> I like their colors too. I've always liked the Sounders colors. Uh, I I think that they're iconic. I think that it's probably the most recognizable brand, if you will, in MLS. And I think that rebrands can always look a little bit dicey, as we've seen with CF Montreal and Chicago Fire. I think this this rebrand was fantastic. I think it's a fresh new look on a team that's that's got so much history, and they did great incorporating all of it. What about you, Dan? You, you seem to be surprised. Two thumbs. I saw. I saw it, and I was I was in love with it. And I hate the Sounders, but I was exactly. in love with it. I lo- I loved it, dude. I thought it was great. And Dex- if I look if I look at gear and merch and like logos, and I'm like, man, would I buy that? Yes or no? I, right. If if I didn't play, I would buy their merch in a heartbeat. Hundred percent. It didn't take me two seconds to be like, damn, that that's sick. You know, it's sleek. It's it's everything Dan said was right. And great point with Chicago. Like that one's just like everybody looked at Chicago was like, <laughs> it was like, what are we doing? What are you doing? Like, what are you doing? Oh, right? what? They did it. I mean, they did it twice in twice in 18 months. Right. They they did it. Twice in 18 months. Yeah. Oh, boy. So, uh, yeah, they, they hit it spot on, dude. It, it's dope. For sure. you, are you are you not? Are, OK, Mr. Let's let's see you take the contrarian view. An artiste, Dax. This guy's an artiste. No, I, I'm giving it. One thumb up. Not so you're just kind of you're just like meh. I like it, yeah. but I don't love no, it. No, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not meh. I I, I like ish. It is where I'm at. <laughs> I feel like they got like they got like seventy five percent of the way there, but then didn't finish it. They're just. It's just not a. It's just not. I don't know. It's it's incomplete for me. I think is what I would say. All the little complementing pieces around it, the carnation. Like you think it's you think it's too simple. Um. Y- yes, I love simplicity. Like I love the simplicity of of logos. I think the two dimensional aspect of it is the way that I would go. Like I mean, look at our. I we redesigned this for Fuse for the club that I run, and it's similar. It's comparable. It's a two D. It's simple. Eh, it's, yours is way worse, but that's fine. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, but in terms just of like kidding. just the space needle um, and just you know the years, it just doesn't feel all the way done. Like I love the the old school Seattle Sounders um, word mark. I like the carnation. I like the orca. I think all of it is is cool. 
the crest for me doesn't do enough. Just I mean, doesn't. But I think when you have, I think when you have great colors and like iconic colors that you can mix and match for new kits, I, I think the colors also help keep the the brand. Popping. It feels like if the it logo feels is like, simple. Yeah, it feels like they just went from like Diadora to Nike. You know, it just, <laughs> it just. You know, it just made dude look at their old one. It, it looks like it's their a, old one is was painful. It has yeah. been painful for it, a really long time. It was time. clunky and yeah, I, I think this yeah. new one this, is this one's sleek, bro. I, yeah, I like. I love this it. one's sleek. Oh, uh, exactly how I would describe Alan Gordon: sleek <laughs> and uh, brilliant with all things fashion. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing for my Brandon eye. Sandy. That, I don't know if it's a good thing for my eye that I agree with Gordo so wholeheartedly on the that's bad. That's <laughs> bad, bad news. I'll tell you, you're sledding down a slippery slope right also, now. Also, you know, we have. I don't know. I know Gordo watches all kinds of soccer now, so I'm sure he'll be tuning in to the new uh, rebranded, slick, sleek Seattle Sounders against Nashville SC coming up this weekend. Big game. Ooh. It is a big game. What, tell, give us a little preview, Dax. Well, you know, the, the boys in gold had a nice little West Coast road trip, you know, beating Kansas City 3-0, good point in San Jose. Week rest, and we got a big game against the Sounders, man. Their no midweek guys... game is, is pretty ideal. Yeah. I don't like I mean, watching Nashville play without you on the field. I got to say that. I tuned in, and there was other games on, and I was like, it just, the middle wasn't the same, bro. They just didn't have the same chemistry, eh? And so I was like, you know, I, it, it was I appreciate I appreciate your support, big man. It was it was a little bit bland for me in the middle, so I switched I switched to another game. It's because you seek. It's because you secretly love redheads. That's why I I love you, buddy. Yeah. Um, I hey, you. I, I want to. I'll leave you with one thing, Gordo Dax. I'll leave you with one thing. Question. Last five years has Virgil Van Dyke been in the prime of his career? Yes. On back to that. How old is yeah. he? He's 32. I think he had, I think he's been out of his prime for the past three seasons. You think Van Dyke's been out of his prime for the past three years? I think years. He's, he's fallen out of his prime. I think right when he came into Liverpool and they were hot, he was the best player in the world. Like and everything, think, like everything, it's not just that cut and dry, Gordo. There's context that needs to be involved. He had a really catastrophic bad injury that took him a year to recover. He hasn't been the same player since, but in general, yes, he hasn't he's been, been the same prime. He hasn't been, he, he asked me a question. Prime. Five years, 27 to 32. Prime. For I think when he was 27, he was all, he was firing on all cylinders <laughs> and yes, it's, it hasn't looked the same since, but okay. So Justin Glad next year he's entering his prime. He's not <laughs> entering his prime. <laughs> Van Dyke came in his prime, bro. Uh, all right. Well, then we'll leave. Well, let's leave that debate open. If you got some comments, drop oh, them. Oh, by in. the way, everyone, I won the um, the career path. I don't know if you guys know that, but I won it. Oh, Jack I was told me. Pick that up. Because everyone, everyone that everyone that wrote in said Dax's career path is way better than inmate FC in, was that on in your Saudi own Arabia. Social? It was just a couple friends fans? who texted me on the side. What did, yeah, what did you guys? You guys yeah. passed. He just passed you a handwritten note. This is the I first sent a poll. I sent a poll out to a bunch of people who listened to us. And yeah, they, your mom and dad, so your mom and dad voted for you. Dart, Cynthia, <laughs> uh, Jack's family, who was in town. <laughs> it's that man, Jack's family. Uh, they all like my career better. But a lot of people did laugh at at Gordo. Um, playing uh behind the uh behind the um the wall <laughs> behind the wall behind with the, the wall of state penitentiary of yeah are these, are these from wall. like your fans like the mccarty's like are uh, they i don't know Gordo. i'm just making it up i had the best career okay what do you want from me <laughs> all right we're wrapping this up thanks for tuning in good luck this weekend dax we'll catch you out Appreciate there it.